स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Let's prove the third silo theorem. So, this is the last of the silo theorems, part 3. It says the following that the number of distinct P silo subgroups of a group G, of a finite group G, is congruent to one modulo P. Okay? And uh, the notation is more or less what we used in all the earlier theorems as well, earlier parts of the theorem that we assume P divides the cardinality of the group. We write uh, cardinality g as p to the d m d is a power that is at least 1 and m of course is a number relatively prime to p which again we assume is 1 or more. Okay, so, uh, let us prove the third silo theorem. Now, this again involves some, some very interesting ideas and as before it uses the, the set x that we have been looking at repeatedly. So, here is the proof. So, let us go back to the action of G on itself. So, G acts on itself by just left translation. So, recall we used both left and right translations in the earlier proof of silo 2. Uh, now, we will go back to just the left translation. So, G acts on itself by left translation and therefore, by the action on subsets, G acts on the set of all subsets of G of cardinality P power D and we call this set X and again to recall the, the key property of X was that it was it had a cardinality which was not divisible by P and for this silo theorem 3 we will recall one additional fact about X we actually knew a little bit more about the cardinality of X further recall the cardinality of X was congruent to m modulo p. Okay. So, this, this little fact has never been used in its full power until now. We have only used the fact that the cardinality of x is not divisible by p. We have never used the exact congruence modulo p that the cardinality satisfies. Okay. And since of course, this particular statement here in silo 3 is a statement about something being congruent to something modulo p it will turn out that this is exactly the fact that that will play a role. Okay. So, uh, let us uh, move on. So, observe that this set x that we keep talking about is actually interesting for the, the following reason. So, what is this set x really? So, this set x, let us draw a picture of the set x. It is the set of all subsets. So, what, what are elements of x? So, it is x is nothing but all subsets of G whose cardinality is P power D. And so, in particular, the P slow subgroups that we are looking at, the uh, H or K that appeared in the earlier one. So, any P silo subgroup, for example, is in fact an element of x. So, let me, uh, let me give them names. So, let us say that let let us assume that the P silo subgroups are the following H1, H2 till some number Hs be the distinct P silo subgroups. So, recall by the second silo theorem, we know they are all conjugates of each other, be the distinct P silo subgroups of G. And so, in fact, they are all elements of, of this set X. So, H1, this subgroup is somewhere in, in X. So, maybe we will just put them in different colors. So, I have H2, another subgroup and so on till I finally get my subgroup Hs just right here. So, this is the last subgroup H sub S. Okay. Now, uh, H sub S. Okay. Now, uh, here are some subsets of cardinality P power D, no doubt. Now, let us do the following. Let us ask the following question. 
since they are all elements of x after all what do their orbits look like so recall the set x is is uh, a g set it's got an action of the group g the action on subsets right so recall what's the action um, g acts on x again worth recalling once more g acting on a subset a is just g a uh, as a runs over a just multiply every element of a on the left so in particular we can ask well what look at these p silo subgroups and let's ask what are their orbits under this action okay so take the p silo subgroup h i for example or let's start with h1 h1 is an element of x it's a subset of cardinality p power d so it's a valid question to ask what's the orbit of this point this this you know it's now just a single point in the set x so what's its orbit under the group action well by definition this is just going to be all elements of the form uh, g h1 okay so remember g h1 is is this g dot a so it's just g dot a h1 as g runs over g this is what the orbit means okay but g dot h1 is well what's that it's just this this uh, set which is you multiply every element of h1 on the left by g okay it's just left multiplication so what is this the sets the subsets you get in this way are exactly the left cosets in other words these are just the left cosets of the set h1 okay so this is an first interesting fact here that uh, when i look at h1 its orbit under the group is just going to be its various left cosets so let me just mark them here so these are the various left cosets of h1 okay so various g h1s so this is the orbit of h1 okay now uh, let's move on to h2 now so observe h2 is not in this orbit okay this this h2 being a distinct p silo subgroup so note that in in the orbit of h1 what you have are h1 and its various cosets among these so observe a coset can never be a subgroup except for the the identity coset meaning the coset of the original subgroup itself all the other guys are not uh, subgroups they are not closed under multiplication so this guy is the only subgroup here and since h2 is assumed to be different from h1 uh, h2 can't can't live inside this orbit right it is the only subgroup among these uh, uh, cosets is the one that i have shaded and so if at all h2 lives in this orbit it has to equal that guy but h2 is not equal to h1 okay so observe h2 is not in the orbit of h1 so that's all i'm i'm trying to say here so observe h2 is in a separate orbit okay so look at orbit of h2 what's that well by the same token this is just a set of all left cosets of h2 and so on so you keep going this way so you observe that uh, at every step the orbit of so these these left cosets here this is the orbit of h2 under the group action okay, and so on till you reach the very end and the orbit of hs will just be its left cosets so that's the last orbit okay and these are all disjoint i mean they are all more or less by definition of orbits they are all disjoint sets so i I've, i've produced some number of elements of the set x okay so let's uh, write x separately here again so x is my my ambient set okay on which the action takes place okay now uh so what have we done so far we have produced some elements of x or rather we have produced some orbits inside the set x now how many elements of x are accounted for in this way okay in other words how many elements are there in each orbit what's the cardinality of each orbit so observe so and so on so this holds all the way till orbit of the last guy a is just going to give me the set of all left cosets of hs okay now observe we know how many left cosets there are of of any subgroup right so observe that the cardinality of the orbit of any one of the hi's by definition is just the number of left cosets 
of hi and that of course is the cardinality of the group divided by the cardinality of hi which in this case is p power d m divided by p power d so that's m exactly okay this holds for all i equals 1 to s any one of the p zero subgroups the orbit cardinalities are exactly m okay so let's go back to our picture of x so what does that mean it means that there are m elements here so the cardinality of this set is m the cardinality of this set is m the cardinality of the last every one of them is m okay and there are s of them so there are you know how many total elements of x are accounted for in these orbits there are m s elements that lie in these s orbits okay now let's uh, look at the other elements of course this doesn't exhaust all the elements of x because these are all very special subsets of cardinality p power d these are either the p zero subgroups themselves or their left cosets okay so these are some very very special kinds of subsets of cardinality p power d but of course there will be lots of other random subsets right so there are many many other subsets here of cardinality p power d in in the group g so of course i have to look at all of them next Okay, so let's look at any one such guy. So let me pick some not so special subset A, which is not of this form and ask. So here's a subset of cardinality P power D. I can ask the same question. What is its orbit going to look like? Okay, again, a very, very interesting question. If I take a random element uh, of cardinality, ra a random subset of cardinality P power D and ask, what is its orbit under the action of the group in other words if i keep hitting it on the left by different group elements it produces new subsets of cardinality p power d what can you say about that orbit how many new subsets will i produce for example these p zero guys are very nice and regular in the sense that uh, we know exactly what you will get when you uh, you know what their orbit looks like when you keep left multiplying these subgroups by elements of g you just produce the different cosets okay but if A is not a subgroup, for example, then it's not clear. It's it's somewhat uh, uh, trickier. It's not so easy to figure out what happens. Okay, so I want to now next try and understand what does the orbit of uh, A look like. Okay, so what is A now? So let's pick. Uh, so I want to say now consider. Uh, okay, so let's let's just note this this fact down as well. The sum of the orbits of these hi's orbit cardinalities for these guys is m times s okay so so many elements are are nice in some sense okay so this is done now let's move on to the other orbits okay next let's pick suppose a is an element of x uh, in other words ie a is a subset of the group of cardinality p power d and a is not in any of these orbits and a is so how should i write it a does not belong to the orbits that we have already looked at okay what does that mean i e a is not a left coset of a p zero subgroup Okay, this is my this is now my assumption on a that it's not uh, uh, a left coset of a p zero subgroup. Now, under this assumption, I want to ask what can I say about the cardinality of the orbit of a? Okay, and here's my claim. Here's an important observation: for all such a, the cardinality of the orbit is divisible by p. This is the important claim. Observe, this does not hold for the, the other nice orbits that we have already looked at. So the orbits that we have looked at, their cardinalities, what was the cardinality was m, right? So these are the, the cardinalities of the, the p zero subgroups. So those guys have orbit cardinalities which are not divisible by p because m is of course not divisible by p by assumption. But if you are not one of these nice orbits, any other orbit has cardinality which is a multiple of p okay so that's our claim okay so let's prove the claim first 
So, proof of claim. Well, as always, we will use the counting formula. If you want to understand how many elements there are in a given orbit, you will have to understand what the stabilizer looks like. Okay, so let me just call this the stabilizer of A. Okay, so what is the stabilizer of A? So let me give that a name. So let L denote the stabilizer of A. It's a certain subgroup, remember, the stabilizer is always a subgroup. Uh, what is it? It's a set of all group elements which stabilize A. In other words, when you hit it on the left, I mean, when you act it on A, you should get back A. Okay. So this is the, the definition of the stabilizer. All those elements of the group such that you take A, you hit it on the left by G, you still get back the same set A. I mean, of course, it can permute the elements of amongst A, but you should, you should just get back the set A again. It should not take an element of A and move it to an element that's outside A. Okay, so this is the um, this is the property of the I mean this is the definition of the stabilizer. So let's try and understand what the relationship is between A and its stabilizer. Okay, so let me draw the set A now. Uh, so maybe I will draw it the way I did in the the inside the set X. So suppose my set A looks like this, like a diamond. So Let's say this is my set A. Okay. Now let's do the following. Let's pick an element A in A. So let's pick uh, an element first A in A. Okay. So take some element. So I've taken some element A. Now look at this stabilizer. So what is the stabilizer? The stabilizer is a, is a certain subgroup with this property. Now observe if I take an element, so consider the right coset L A. Okay, L is a subgroup, A is an element, I can look at the right coset L A. What is this? This is just all elements of the form L A where L comes from L. Okay, but observe that L multiplied by A, so according to this formula, if I take an element of A, I mean according to this definition, if I take an element of A and multiply it by an element from the stabilizer, the answer should again be inside A. So observe that every element of the form L A must again be inside A by definition of the stabilizer. Okay, so what does that mean? I take A and if I look at this left coset L A, well, that entire thing is a subset of A. So as soon as an element belongs to A, its entire right coset uh, of L belongs to A. Okay, so this entire thing is there. Okay, now we keep going. Suppose this exhausts A, then we are done. If not, there is another element inside A. Okay. So uh, maybe we should call this A1, pick an element A1 inside A. If LA1 is, is all of A, stop. Otherwise, look for an element A2, which is not in LA1, which is in A. Okay, apply the same reasoning. So pick A2 in A. So if LA1 is not the whole set A, pick A2, which is in A, but not in LA1. And now again, by the same reasoning, conclude that L A2 is also a subset of A. Okay, again, by the definition of the stabilizer. So this, this entire uh, coset L A2 is inside A and so on. So you keep going that way till you observe that as soon as some element is there, its entire right coset is there. Okay, which means finally, this process has to stop because everything is a finite set. And finally, when this process stops, what would you have obtained? you would have realized A as a union, A can therefore be written as a union of some right cosets of L, right? Some finitely many right cosets of L, uh, they are all disjoint necessarily. That union of those many, some finitely many of them should give you the set A, okay? So this is just, we are just applying the definition of the stabilizer. Okay, and the action on subsets. So what does that mean in particular? It says in particular, this means that the cardinality of A has to equal cardinality of L times the number of right cosets which are contained, the number of right cosets which of L which are contained in A. In other words, this means that the cardinality of L, whatever it is, must divide the cardinality of A, okay? Because this is some number, of course. 
So it means that uh, the left hand side is a multiple of the cardinality of L. Okay, but observe the cardinality of A was p power d to begin with. So what this means is therefore the cardinality of L must also be some power of a prime. It must look like some p power j where j is a number between 0 and d. Okay, so we have concluded that the, the stabilizer is also a p group. But observe that but the key point here is that uh, L cannot have cardinality p power d but uh, observe that uh, j cannot equal d. Okay, this maximum value is not allowed. Okay, why not? Because of the following reason if j equals d because if j equals d then what that means is that L has cardinality p power d which means if you look at the, the earlier or look at this, this equation here the cardinality of A is p power d, the cardinality of L is also p power d which means that there should be exactly one right coset of L which is contained in A. Okay? So what that means is that I mean, or if you look at this earlier picture the at the very first step the very first right coset that you form that already exhausts the entire set A because the cardinality of that right coset is already p power d. Okay? So what this means is that A looks like this, it is just a single right coset, just L A 1 alone will do the job, the very first one will do the job. Okay? So A is a, is a single right coset and L remember has cardinality p power d. So what does that mean? Well, uh, it means L of course is therefore a p silo subgroup and A is a right coset of a p silo subgroup. But observe that because of silo theorem number 2, here is something we can do. Let me rewrite this as follows a1 inverse L a1. Okay, so, I will write this as a1 times this guy here is just a conjugate of L1 is, is, a, is a conjugate of L. So, I will call this uh, L dash maybe. Okay. So, what is L dash? L dash is another subgroup whose cardinality is p power d. Okay. So, what have I finally concluded? I have concluded that my set A is therefore a left coset of a p silo subgroup. Okay? So, well because you know all these p silo subgroups are I mean conjugate of a p silo subgroup is a p silo subgroup. So, the right coset of a p silo subgroup is also the left coset of a different p silo subgroup that is all we are saying here. Okay? Now, but that recall is a contradiction because we assume to begin with that the set A was not uh, where was this assumption? We assume that A is not a left coset of a p silo subgroup. It was such an A that we are looking at. So, if J equals D, however, we conclude that A does look like that. A has to have that form. Okay? So, this contradiction, this contradiction implies that our assumption was wrong. J has to be strictly smaller than D, it can't equal D. But if j is strictly smaller than d, well, what does that mean? Cardinality of L is p power j, recall. Uh, so, j is strictly smaller than d. Therefore, the orbit cardinality, the orbit of the set A that we looked at, its cardinality looks like cardinality g by the cardinality of the stabilizer, which is p to the d minus j, which is some strictly positive power of p. Okay, so, this is uh, this is divisible by p because this d minus j is a strictly positive number. So, p therefore divides the orbit cardinality okay, as required as claimed. So, this proves our claim. Okay, so, let us uh, take stock where are we now? We have gone back to our let us go back to this picture that we drew right in the beginning. So, we have this set x, we have these nice regular orbits okay, which are the cosets of silo subgroups and then we have uh, sort of all these other irregular orbits. Now, these orbits are orbits of other su subsets A which are not uh, cosets of silo subgroups and what we have just shown is that this orbit you know the, the, the different the number of subsets that you get. So, this orbit cardinality is divisible by p. So, p divides 
the cardinality of this orbit. And the same holds for the other subsets as well. So if I pick uh, some other arbitrary subset A, which is not in this orbit, and I look at its orbit, you know, how many other subsets are obtained by left translating this by G, that orbit again will have cardinality, which is a multiple of P and so on. Okay. Okay. So uh, finally, where does this, this uh, lead us? So now let's look at this big subset X and ask, how many elements are there in X? So there are these two types uh, of elements. So on the one side, we said that these nice orbits, they account for MS elements, but the total size of X. So now let me compute the total size of X, which is these nice orbits and these not so nice orbits. So observe now the cardinality of X is first it is MS. So these come from the nice orbits. left cosets of silo subgroups and so on, plus these other orbits. So these sum of uh, cardinality of orbits OI. So let me just call it OI for now, where, where what is OI? OIs are these not so nice orbits, if you wish, uh, whose cardinalities are divisible by P. So this is orbits of subsets A, um, which are not left cosets, which are not left cosets of P silo subgroups. So these are the not so nice orbits. And so what this gives us is MS plus what we have here, we have just shown is divisible by P, right? So this is a multiple of P. Each orbit here is uh, has cardinality, which looks like P times something. So the net answer is congruent. So this, this part is divisible by P. So I can ignore it when I'm looking at congruence modulo P. So I conclude that the cardinality of X is therefore congruent to M times S modulo P, where S is the number of zero subgroups. Okay. But observe, we already know something, but we know, and this is the fact I recall right in the beginning that the cardinality of X by our other arguments is already congruent to M modulo P. Okay. So therefore we conclude that the number M and M S had better be congruent to each other modulo P. And well, the, we're almost there. You can observe if you cancel the M from both sides, it implies that S is congruent to one mod P. Okay, and uh, so that's the end of the proof. Just a little aside on this, this cancellation of M. So remember I can cancel M because M is not congruent to zero modulo P. Okay, if uh, M is not divisible by P, I can cancel M from both sides of a congruence. And uh, why is that? Because, so recall what's given is this. I know I'm given that MS is congruent to M modulo P. This just means that their difference ms minus m is divisible by p. This is what the congruence means. But this means in particular that m p divides m times s minus 1. And uh, if p divides a product, but recall if, when p divides a product, but p doesn't divide one of the terms, right? This, this factor m has no powers of p in its prime factorization, then it means that p must divide the other term. That's the only way out. In other words, S must be congruent to one mod P. Okay, so this is just a little proof of why cancellation is, is valid. Okay, so again, so to, to broadly summarize the idea of uh, the proof here, it, it again comes back to the to the very same thing as, as before. This, this action on cosets is what we, we study here. So the key point is really in understanding this, this figure here on this uh, on the screen, which is when you look at all the subsets of X and you look at the left translation action on subsets, the silo subgroups and their cosets, they form a bunch of nice regular orbits. Okay? Each orbit has cardinality M. And if there are S silo subgroups, the total, total number is MS. And then all the other orbits are the not so nice orbits, which are orbits of subsets A, which are not of this form. 
but those orbits all have cardinalities which are divisible by p okay so all those orbits will be divisible by p whereas each of these orbits are 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 not divisible by p okay and and then that coupled with the what we know about the cardinality of x completes the proof okay